And we are live on this Lord's Day morning. Hello, friends. Pro-Life leader Frank Pavone here of Priests for Life. Let's pray today. Let's delve into the scriptures. Let's have a great third Sunday of Easter. Third Sunday of Easter. We have a period of 50 days, and Easter was just two weeks ago today, and we are rejoicing with alleluias carried out in all throughout the the, the world, in, in every culture, and uh, brothers and sisters, the joy should be overflowing. Death has been conquered. Jesus Christ is risen. That's the foundation of our confidence as we fight the pro-life battle, as we fight all the battles involved in advancing the kingdom of God, as we fight in this election year, all the battles involved in saving our nation. So we're going to learn more about this in the reading of today. I'm just going to zero in on the second reading and uh, draw a very important insight from, uh, from that. So let's put ourselves in the presence of God. And as always, I can see your comments. Feel free to leave your prayer intentions in the comments so that we can all pray for one another very specifically. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We praise you, Father, for the resurrection of your Son. We continue to celebrate with Easter joy the fact that death no longer has the final word in the human story. We celebrate, Lord God, the fact that sin is conquered and therefore we, with even greater confidence than ever, repent of our sins. We ask forgiveness. We ask that we might make some reparation for our sins. We ask that we might walk in holiness of life. Guard us from those hidden sins, Lord, which are doing destruction to us and others, and we may not even realize it. Let our whole earth repent of sin. Let us also renew the structures of our society that have embedded sin in our midst, such as those structures which support the killing of babies by abortion and all kinds of other injustice. Help us now, Lord, as we study the Scriptures to understand your word more deeply, live it more faithfully, and proclaim it more effectively through Christ our Lord. Amen. And you know, that's one of the differences between what we do and just a, a religion class or a lecture. You know, many people study the Scripture but don't necessarily exercise any devotion to it or faith in it as the Word of God. This is not simply a, a university lecture. This is a devotion. This is receiving the Word of God with faith. You know, I always say you do theology on your knees. It starts with the yes of faith. And then we inform our minds more deeply about what that faith says. Let's look at the second reading of today, a reading from the first letter of St. John. My children, I am writing this to you so that you may not commit sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the Righteous One. He is expiation for our sins, and not for our sins only, but for those of the whole world. The way we may be sure that we know Him is to keep His commandments. Those who say, I know him, but do not keep his commandments, are liars, and the truth is not in them. But whoever keeps his word, the love of God is truly perfected in him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Isn't it fascinating how People like to say, don't judge me. And they claim that their relationship with God is their personal business. And in many other ways, using many other words, they'll say what this reading says. I know him. Oh, well, don't judge me. I'm, I'm a faithful Catholic. I'm a believer. I'm a follower of God. I know him. I know him. And, and we're supposed to bow to them and say, oh yes, okay, well, you know, I, I, I can't enter into your personal, individual, intimate relationship with God. And, and of course, there's truth to that. But here's the problem, and here's the challenge of this reading. What you say and also what you do, 
the actions you engage in, the causes you champion, the way you spend your time, and how you conduct yourself and your relationships with others are visible to us. We think of those politicians, right, who claim to be, oh, I know him, I know him. And then they advance godless policies. Hey, listen, we can't see inside your soul. We get that. We, re- we don't have to remind ourselves of that. We, we can't see inside your soul. But we could see outside. We can hear what you're saying. We can see the causes you're championing. We can see the fruits of your works. You champion evil. We can tell. Why can we tell? Because you're telling us. The way we can be sure that we know Him is to keep His commandments. Notice what the reading says. His commandments, not ours. His commandments, not my own truth, my own opinion, not even my own interpretation of the commandments. His commandments... So the reading today is telling us something very critical. We know that we cannot know the inner workings of a person's mind, heart, soul, and relationship with God. But this reading is telling us there's a bridge. There's a connection between those inner workings and what's going on on the outside. Keep His commandments. In fact, it even tells us how we can tell who the liars are. If someone's not keeping His commandments, it doesn't matter what they say. In in psychiatry, they have that old axiom, believe behavior. Person is drinking nonstop at a water fountain, gulping, gulping, gulping. And then they turn around to to, to you in between gulps. No, 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 I'm not thirsty. I'm not thirsty. And then they go back to breathlessly gulping down the water. What are you going to believe? Their words or their behavior? Psychiatrists say believe behavior. And scripture says it too. The way we may be sure that we know him is to keep his commandments. The one who says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar. This idea of knowing him, by the way, let's turn to, Jesus talks about this on the night before he died. John 17, the Last Supper discourse. Listen to these words because he defines what eternal life is. Jesus is speaking and and, and sitting with them, and he says, and this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God. He's addressing the Father here in his high priestly prayer. That they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. That they know you. This is eternal life. Now, John is saying in this first letter, in this passage, that there's life because it's the living of the commandments. This is why Christianity is called the Way, with a capital W. You see this, for example, in Acts chapter 9, when it talks about St. Paul persecuting the Christians. He said, it said he, was, he had letters to round up and imprison any of those who were following the Way. So it's life. It's a way of living. And and Jesus says this eternal life that we have, which starts now, consists in knowing the true God, knowing Jesus Christ. Now, okay. Put in a different way, knowing God changes us. And one more scripture that sheds light on this is Paul's second letter to the Corinthians. In chapter 3, he talks about we have a new covenant, a ministry of life. You know, old covenant was teaching people the law. Here's where you went wrong, but it didn't give the redemption that we have in Christ Jesus. But now we have new hope. We can rise above our sins. And it, he refers to Moses knowing God. Now, Moses had a special relationship with God. In fact, it was like a prophecy of Christ. You know, Christ Jesus, of course, is one in being with the Father. He is God. So he knows God like nobody else. And remember when he said, nobody knows the Father except the Son. Uh, and no one knows the Son except the Father. Um, 
there's a knowledge there which is an eternal life. It's, it's the life of the Trinity. Moses had a very special relationship with God. Scripture says he spoke to God face to face, like one man speaking to his friend. And when Moses would convene with God, he, he would come away from that time of prayer, and it was so intimate that his face got transformed. And if you recall, he had to wear a, a, a veil over his face because it was like, it was like, it, 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 was, it was jarring for the people. All right. So with that background in mind, Paul is writing to the Corinthians and he says, he starts using the example of this veil and he says, when you turn to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now he's talking about a veil in another sense, veiling our understanding of the word that we are reading. But when we turn to the Lord, we come to a deeper understanding. The veil is removed. And then verse 17, now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. This is a very powerful verse from 2 Corinthians 3. We see the Lord, he says, we know the Lord. Moses knew the Lord intimately. Christ Jesus, of course, knows the Father in a unique way because he's equal to him. We get to know the Lord too. Two things about this. Number one, when we know the Lord, and again, this ties in with exactly what today's reading is saying, it changes us, it changes the way we live, the knowledge itself. It's the interaction with the Lord that changes us. If Moses' conversation with God made his face glow, and that was under the old covenant, what does our knowledge of Christ do to us with Christ Jesus living within us? We're to be completely transformed what we desire, what we think, what we believe, what we want, what we do, how we endure, we get transformed from glory to glory by the Lord who is the Spirit. That's one thing. The other is, you know, so many people debate about religion. They make arguments for or against. There are some people who they go online and all they try to do is disprove the scriptures or discredit Christianity or the, the life or existence or teachings of Jesus. And then they may challenge believers to give evidence, to get, defend, defend your faith. Now we have to be able to defend the faith. But you know, they consistently, no matter what kind of arguments those who may argue against us have, or no matter what kind of demands they may make of us to show that it is reasonable to believe what we believe, and we need to be able to explain that, there's one thing that they consistently miss that we must not miss, and it's this. Our faith in Jesus is not simply the result of some conclusion we come to by historical, enlightenment, uh, historical analysis study, syllogisms, reasoning. There's a place for all that. Theology and historical study and biblical study include all that. But what's the missing element in so many of these conversations and debates back and forth? It's very simple. We know him. And then I say to people, you know, they, they, oh, I'm not so sure if, uh, how do I know if God is real? I'm not so sure if Jesus is, is real. How am I, how do I know that he rose from the dead? Well, listen, there's a lot of evidence for that from human reason and history. But the bottom line is, we know him. The apostles, when they went out and preached, they weren't simply preaching the conclusion of a rational analysis. They were preaching their experience. They met the Lord. They knew the Lord. They ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead, like we read at the beginning of the Acts of the Apostles. We ate and drank. We are witnesses to him. We ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. Now, we weren't there with them to sit with Jesus in a human form. But do we not encounter the living Christ? Have you not encountered him? Have you not met him? Do you not know him? 
in that sense of the term, because friends, anybody who is not sure of the answer to that has a lot more in store for them. Because God wants to give you exactly that experience. That you know Him. Is anybody going to, if you have a, a, a sibling, is anybody going to convince you that your sibling doesn't exist? When you know them? You have a friend. His name is John Smith. And somebody comes along to you one day and says, listen, I, I got news for you. John Smith isn't, isn't a real person. He doesn't exist. You're going to laugh at them. You don't have to prove with some logistic syllogism that John Smith exists. He's your friend. This is the kind of witness that we have to give to the world. This is what Jesus is saying is eternal life. This is what John is saying in this letter is, is the, 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 the gift of Easter. What's the gift of Easter? That we know him. He rose again in order to dwell in us. He rose again so that he could bestow on us his spirit. That's why Easter is so baptismal. Remember two weeks ago what happened at Mass? Did the water hit you and the, the priest went through the, the aisle is sprinkling the water? You know, sometimes they're more thorough than others. I was very thorough. The Ma Easter Masses that I said, I'm, oh, I'd be dunking that thing every two seconds. You splash people. Make, I want to make sure that the water is running down on them. Because this is the water of eternal life. Baptismal water. Easter is so baptismal because the gift of Easter to us, it, it, it's very simple. Christ Jesus is risen from the dead. He wants us to know him. And that's the gift. When we know him, it transforms us. And we keep his commandments. We don't just keep his commandments as if we're just checking off. the. the we're going down the list. Check, okay, I did what I had to do. Friends, it's deeper than that. Again, 2 Corinthians 3. When we see the glory of the Lord, what does it do? It transforms us into glory, which means what? That the living of the commandment, we don't even need to see the list. It, 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 here's, how, here's the way it's supposed to be. The Spirit of God transforms us so much. We, are, we know Jesus face to face. Of course, not face to face in the literal sense that we will be in heaven. We know Him by faith. In heaven, we'll see him face to face. But face to face in the sense of, yeah, we know for sure that he's there. We're not just thinking of something. He's there. We experience him. Okay, here's my point. The transformation in us that happens as a result of that, what we think, what we want, what's important to us, what we love, what we yearn for, how we make our choices, becomes a way of life so that we live that first and then if we went back and we go down the list of the commandments or we go down a, 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 an examination of conscience or we go down the points of the, the moral law, we're, we're looking at something that's simply, it's like a diary. So, oh yeah, well, of course. Well, of course I did that. It's not like, oh, here, give me the list and I'll, I'll, check, I'll check off the boxes, make sure I do it. It's the other way around. We get transformed and then we go back to the list. Oh yeah, that to me, it's like looking in the mirror. That's eternal life. That when you read the commandments, you're not looking at some kind of burdensome list of things that, oh, now I, well, here's what I have to do. No, you're looking in the mirror. You're looking at your diary. Yeah, that's me. That's me. This is the beauty of Easter. The power, the transformation. And, and, and you look at that in the context of pro-life. Why in the world? Should we have to, ha have to convince somebody to be pro-life? You know, listen what we're talking about. In favor of life. Do, do you want to be dead? Is that the, the alternative? Right? I mean, when, in a sense, pro-life, it's like, you know, sometimes people say to me, priest for life, why should there be priest for life? Isn't, isn't, every, isn't every priest for life? And I scratch my head and I say, well... It's the same reason there has to be a pro-life movement. Why isn't every person for life? After all, they're alive. You only need one criterion to be pro-life, and that is to be alive. Because if you're alive, you, you're living the fact that life is better than death. You're, you're on this side of existence, and you're not in non-existence. So just there's one criterion for being pro-life. It's not that you, you, oh, you got to be Catholic, you got to be Christian, you got to be Republican. No, 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 no. 
you're alive. And that's pro-life. And when we know Jesus, again, looking at the commandments, here's what we have to do. It's like, oh yeah, so it's like looking in the mirror. Oh yeah, I had to, taken care of, I've already been living it. So let's pray for a transformation of our entire society because of people who have come to know the risen Jesus. And if people want to know how to know him and they're not sure if they know him or they know that they don't know him, you just have to knock. Call on him. It's no, nothing complicated. Jesus, I'm not sure you're there. Could you please let me know today? Just that, That's it. And sometimes in, in talking to people, I've been asked sometimes on radio interviews or TV interviews, hey, Father, what would you say to people who are here that, you know, they're not so sure if they believe any of this? Just ask. Just the, the Lord, the reality is the Lord is there. And he wants you to know him. So if there's a gap there and you're not sure if you know him, this is different from just say, th- believing that he exists. But if you're not sure that you know him, he's there for the asking. Lord, please reveal yourself to me today. Please, Lord, make it more real. He will. He wants nothing more than that. You know, there's some prayers God always says yes to. Lord, let me uh, make $1,000 this week. Well, not, you know, he, he, there's no guarantee he's going to say yes to that. Lord, let my... Uh, my, my sports team win the, win the game. Yeah, maybe, maybe he'll say yes, maybe not. Lord, let me get this job. Maybe yes, maybe not. But Lord, let me know you. Lord, reveal yourself to me. Lord, make your, your love and your existence more real to me. I guarantee you he wants to say yes to that prayer. Ask him and have your fellow believers and your friends and anyone you're trying to reach and influence, have them ask him to. Let's pray. Lord, you are real. You are with us. You are in us. The gift of Easter has been poured out on us. We have been immersed in your death and resurrection by baptism. We are the living people of life. Lord, we know you. And knowing you, Lord, we're not like those that pretend. We're not like those pro-abortion people who go around showing off their rosaries and their crosses and saying they're faithful Catholics. No, we know you. And we know that knowing you transforms us, immerses us in a new way of life. We know you and we rejoice in that. Lord, we pray today for those, especially those that we know who don't know you. Give them that gift. Give them that blessing. Give them that certainty. Give them that experience. For those around the world who don't know you, may they hear the saving preaching of the gospel. For those who are ill and those in difficult circumstances, let them know the strength of your presence, your comfort, your healing. For those deep in sin that they feel like they cannot get out of, let them know the power of your mercy and forgiveness. And Lord, for those, all of us, who are deeply distressed at the evils in the world, let us know your saving power as we see you destroy those evils. Destroy the fortress of abortion and the sick, twisted, deceptive arguments that support it. Lord, let us know your saving power as we see you Advance the kingdom of life. Save our nation, Lord. Let us know you by the wisdom you give us as we approach our elections. We need your wisdom. Our fellow citizens, our fellow voters need your wisdom. Help us, Lord. Strengthen us this day to be witnesses to your kingdom of life. And we pray now in the words that Jesus gave us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. 
Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. All right, friends, great to be with you. Tune in each day. Let other people know. I appreciate your efforts. I know many of you do this. Let other people who might be interested in these kinds of broadcasts know about them because we promote them constantly, but guarantee there's some people only you can reach that we can't, and that's where you can be of tremendous benefit both to us and to them as they get a chance to pray with us and hear these reflections on the Scriptures. And, uh, you know, the past, we're live right now, but the past episodes you can always see at the webpage, The Bible and Abortion. Dot com the Bible and abortion uh, and uh, obviously on the various platforms where you watch whether it's X or YouTube or Rumble or Facebook whatever uh, uh, we leave the videos up there all the time as well so thank you very much have a great Lord's Day oh hang on for a minute I'll show you a special clip that I want to uh, show you from uh, the man who started the abortion industry and then became pro life and then became a fan of Priests for Life. I think you know who I'm talking about, but if you've never seen this, I want to play it again for you. And then we'll talk to you tomorrow. God bless. Priests for Life is an extraordinarily fine group, uh, and I, I don't say that in order to um, make anybody feel better or flatter anyone. Uh, it's, an, it's an unusual and a very unique group in that most of the priests whom I have encountered across this country and indeed around the world uh, shy away from the subject of abortion. They somehow want to keep it under the rug and only pull it out when they're ordered to. Uh, in my own experience as a Catholic convert for the last several years, um, I've attended a great many masses and listened to a great many homilies, and I think, believe in three years I've listened only to one homily on the subject of abortion, and that was here in St. Patrick's Cathedral. Other than that, priests seem not to want to talk about it. And Priests for Life is the Paul Revere of this whole gestalt, that Priests for Life are riding around trying to galvanize the rest of the clergy into getting engaged in what is one of the most appalling revolutions of the 20th century. And I am uh, enormously grateful to them and admire their work enormously. But unfortunately, I believe that there are not enough, that Priests for Life should, be, should have a staff 20 times what it has now.